Thanks for this opportunity. I'm Jonathan Thompson from the Harvard Forest, and uh, I'm going to start off with some site news. First, some rather sad news is that just last month, uh, Dave Kittredge, who's been a long time collaborator in the LTER, passed away after a uh, a few years of struggle with brain cancer. So we're all still reeling from, from that. And uh, I expect that for some of you that'll be news. So I'm sorry to pass that on, but uh, it's a big shift for us. Uh, on to more pleasant news. Uh, we have a few sources of new funding in the past year. The exciting one was that our REU site grant was renewed. And Aaron Ellison, who has been the PI now since uh, the 95 or so, is passing the reins on to Audrey Barker Plotkin and Sydney Record, who have taken over as the new REU PIs. We also, um, Audrey and I, received a, a rapid grant to examine the carbon starvation hypothesis as it relates to gypsy moths. And I'll talk about that a little more in a second. And then uh, Sarita Fry and others received an LTRIB grant to maintain the two sets of soil warming plots and literally keep the electricity going. So that's an expensive project and uh, wouldn't, wouldn't happen on LTR funds alone. You're looking out in this picture here over uh, Prospect Hill and that big tower you see is the Neon Tower and it's finally um, uploading data which is exciting because that little tower you see next to it is Steve Wassey and Bill Munger's uh, long-running EMS tower which is on like its 32nd year or something and uh, so there are a lot of exciting opportunities to compare the data between the two uh, which will be interesting methodologically uh, and as you can see, they're going to have really different footprints that uh, neon towers up really high above the canopy. And so uh, we'll be able to ask some scaling questions and other interesting things. So uh, in that theme, I'm going to kind of keep the my topics focused on breadth rather than depth and talk about new projects or projects that have uh, had a significant milestone in the past year or so, and then talk about how that each of these will impact how we're looking at the future of uh, New England's forest. Okay. Oops. So the first thing I want to talk about is the return of the gypsy moth, who, which had um, been at almost negligible levels for more than 30 years. But in 2015, an outbreak uh, reoccurred. In 2016, it really got going. And we have now have this uh, thousands of hectares of oak mortality across southern New England. And we have many areas that have been defoliated once, twice, and three times, which creates this fleeting and exciting opportunity to address this fundamental question in ecology, which is, uh, what, is what are the proximal causes of tree mortality? And this is a really uh, great system to work in because oaks are rainforest species and they initiate growth and build new xylem prior to bud break. So they really need to draw on their non-structural carbon reserves. And uh, the hypothesis is that the secondary growth and fleshing will be impossible and adequate as those reserves get drawn down and the trees will die. And so that's the sort of theory you see exposed in that death spiral on the left part of this, this slide. In the center, you can see the really excellent work of Val Pasquarella, who harnesses the Landsat time series to be able to map uh, defoliation events in near real time. It's really slick. You, can, you should follow her on Twitter in the, in the growing season because she gets these maps uploaded quite quickly. And then this allowed us to find areas that had been defoliated uh, once, twice, and three times. And that's what you can see this far plot on the, on the right side of the screen. And you can see, not unexpectedly, that gray area shows the portion of mortality and that the area, the yellow bars have been defoliated three times and that there's a lot more mortality there. The NSC samples are in the lab and the lab is locked tight uh, during our um, uh, pandemic here. But so that's one of the things we're excited to get to in the next years to be able to test this hypothesis as it relates to NSC drawdowns in this oak system. Uh, the next project, exciting news, is the uh, we finished the second 
census of our 35 hectare forest geo plot, uh, which is pretty exciting. We, uh, the crews measured more than 122,000 individual tree stems, uh, 7,000 of which were new. Many of those were hemlock, despite the hemlock woolly adelgid, which by and large is killing hemlocks, but they're still recruiting in, in the understory. Um, there are 18,000 dead stems in this new remeasure, 5,000 of which are hemlock, which is interesting. Lots of um, other uh, dead, mostly understory trees. And this census also uh, revealed a sort of interesting uh, phenomenon where 97% of this uh, viburnum species, wither rod, have died, more than 1,800 stems. Nobody even noticed this was happening. Uh, until we remeasured it and they are all gone. We speculate that it's this viburnum beetle, but we really don't know, and were it not for the census, we wouldn't know. Overall, the average basal area increased uh, pretty substantially despite all this mortality. This decidedly low-tech um, permanent plot of you know lots of boots on the ground and lots of DBH tapes has uh, facilitated a lot of decidedly high-tech ecology, including the images you see on the right, taken by Peter Boucher, a recent PhD uh, graduate who uh, used terrestrial LIDAR scanning to be able to show hemlock declines. You can see an image of healthy hemlock up in the top and then uh, an area with about a third of the hemlock uh, died. It's also been really interesting for the um, for the NEON aerial observation platform, which Peter also used in his dissertation. And this, this plot in general has just been a boon for remote sensing and flux research and demography and modeling and has been uh, a really wonderful addition to our LTR. And it's part of this Forest Geo Global Network uh, run by the Smithsonian. Uh, the next project I want to talk about relates to forest edges, and this is work led by Lucy Hutera and Andy Ryman and, and others. And here, uh, through a series of long-term, heavily in, intensively measured plots on Harvard Forest and in Boston, actually, uh, we find that forest carbon uptake is 40 to 60 percent greater within 20 meters of a non-forest edge. On this plot on the right side of the screen, you can see the um, green bars facing down. That's above ground woody increment uh, enhancement due to being on the edge. So that's the difference between the edge and the interior. The red side, the red bars are the uh, increased soil respiration. But in all but one of the six plots we have, which is a road plot, which has is really quite distinct from the others. The above ground woody increment way offsets the increase in soil respiration and you end up with a substantial net flux into the forest. And um, that's what you see in the gray bars. Now you might be thinking, well, 20 meters from the edge, that's not a very substantial part of the forest. Um, but if you were thinking that, you'd be wrong, particularly in Boston where you can see that um, empirical cumulative distribution plot there shows that 80% uh, of the forests in Boston are within 20 meters from an edge, and you can see a map of that down uh, below. Overall, about 25% of all the forest area in Massachusetts, a state which is 70% forested, is within 20 meters of an edge. So uh, we contend that getting a better understanding of carbon dynamics along uh, non-forest edges is critical for getting a fuller picture of our overall carbon budget. Uh, all of these studies continue to uh, feed into this modeling framework that we've been building now for uh, at least two LTR cycles. And it's this combination of a land cover model Dynamica, a landscape model Landis, and an ecophysiology model PNET. Uh, we slowly uh, integrate all as much of the LTR science and broader science as we can to be able to both synthesize and scale up. Um, Probably some of you have heard about our scenarios project, which was sort of a centerpiece of our uh, last LTR, LTR5, and that where we worked with hundreds of stakeholders from throughout the region who articulated these alternative futures. And we've recently had a bunch of new analyses come out looking at how each one of these different futures um, would affect things like conservation priorities, forest carbon, stream flows and flooding, and wildlife habitat. 
uh, as a very quick aside, this go it alone scenario, the one on the left, was sort of the, always the boring scenario that nobody expected would happen. But now uh, with the pandemic, there, uh, we actually just applied for some more money to be able to look at how this particular scenario seems to be playing out as things go, uh, as we hunker down and uh, have uh, a lot of what was speculated in that scenario seems to be playing out. Anyway, this whole framework has led to some really exciting opportunities for outreach and, and policy impacts, including if you find yourself with nothing to do, go to newenglandlandscapes.org and you can explore all of these on the New England Landscapes Futures tool where you can look at all these futures and all their ecological impacts. That information was used for a major new report from the Audubon Society called Losing Ground. And very exciting, uh, our lab is now running uh, the land use sector for the Massachusetts Decarbonization Study, which is part of the Global Warming Solutions Act and legislatively mandates the state to reach net zero by 2050. And we're using this whole modeling framework and all these LTR data uh, to help the state find a pathway to uh, net zero by 2050. So it's been a great opportunity to get the science out of the tower and into uh, policymakers' hands. That's all I got. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan.